Hey there, it's the Communications. Welcome back to another review, this time of the 1981 film Deadly Blessing. Now, Deadly Blessing is a film that's directed by Wes Craven, uh, in terms of continuing the Wes Craven filmography. It uh, has a screenplay written by Glenn M. Bennis, Matthew Barr, and Wes Craven. So Wes Craven also helped with the story uh, and the screenplay for the film. Um, it stars Marin Jensen in her last, pretty much her last acting role. Sharon Stone as Lana Marcus, one of her first ever, I think it's her uh, acting debut, I think. Susan Buckner as Vicki Anderson. Jeff East as John Schmidt. Jeff East was in Stranger in Our House, Summer of Fear. He was in that film. So it seems like Wes liked what liked his work in that film, so he got him to be in this movie. Colleen Riley as Melissa. Douglas Barr as Jim Schmidt. Lisa Hartman as Faith Stoller. Lois Nettleton as Louisa Stoller. Ernest Borgnine as Isaiah Schmidt. Michael Berryman as William Gluntz, so Michael Berryman is also on the film, uh, reuniting with Wes Craven after The Hills of Eyes. Kevin Cooney plays the sheriff, and you even have the voice of Percy Rodriguez, who was the narrator for so many great movie trailers back in the 70s and the 80s, and you might recognize his voice from the Jaws trailer. So, he's the one that did the narration for the Jaws trailer, and he also narrates this film. So, he does an opening narration for the movie, and then he does an ending narration for the film, which I thought was really cool. It was really cool to hear Percy Rodriguez's voice in a movie. And it's not really the movie trailer, it's actually in the movie. The film was shot on location in Waka, Waka, Wakahachi, Texas. The real spider was dropped into Stone's mouth in the infamous uh, spider dream sequence. She initially rejected and participated in the scene until the spider was defanged, and they did that. They defanged the spider. I don't know how they did it, but they defanged the spider, and then, then she was able to do the scene. And actor Michael Berryman, of course, had previously worked with, with Craven and the Hills of Eyes. Universal, the primary distributor for Polygram produced films at the time, chose not to pick up the finished project until January 22nd, uh, I, I love how it says 2013, which I think that's the Wikipedia must be wrong because I don't think that this film was released <laughs> in theaters in 2013. It was instead released in theaters by. Uh, they chose not to pick up the finished project until January 22nd, 2013. So maybe they picked up the rights for Deadly Blessing so Scream Factory could release it uh, on Blu ray. But it was instead released in theaters by United Artists and was the last United Artists film released in Trans-American era before being acquired by MGM in the same year. So, it's the last United Artists film that was released. Okay, I didn't know that. And the reason why is because of Heaven's Gates. Freaking Michael Cam Camino's Western that bankrupted almost the entire, basically bankrupted the entire studio. That's a whole other story. But anyway... Deadly Blessing is a film that I really was not, I was, part of me wasn't looking forward to it because I remember, I don't think I saw the film all the way through before and I heard bad things about it. It gets like a 5.5 out of 10 on IMDb, like a 20% Rotten Tomatoes. And I remember seeing like a couple clips, but I didn't, I didn't mind those. I remember the trailer, there's the idea of the Amish or the Hittites doesn't really, doesn't really wasn't really interesting to me, but boy, did this film surprise me! <laughs> I like this movie. I really did. I it was it was it was a surprise. I surprisingly enjoyed and liked a lot of things about this film. Now it wasn't everything though, and there are a few things about the film that do definitely hurt the movie a lot for me. But overall, I was really pleasantly surprised by this film, and I think it's a little bit underrated. I think it's one of Craven's. Uh, lesser known films and I think it's got some really good standout performances by some of the cast members it's got some really tense frightening sequences in it uh, the sequences of the dream sequences with Sharon Stone the scene where the spider falls from the ceiling into her mouth I mean that's something that just gives me 
chills down my spine just thinking about it. And um, the sequence in the barn, which I thought was was also Sharon Stone. She's been terrified by something in the barn, and that that was a really well set up sequence. The way that it was edited, the way that it was approached, I really liked it. Uh, how the doors lock, and then all the windows start getting blocked up, and then she's trying to find a way out. She goes up into the attic, all the cobwebs, all the spiders, and then there's like this person in the shadows that grabs her. So th there was definitely moments in the film that I was like, "Ooh, holy shit!" Uh, the uh, the twists, for the most part, in the story. Uh, especially a couple near the end I did not see coming. And I'll get into those a little bit more in depth after I go through the synopsis of the film. But I did not care for the ending. I did not care for the last shot, few shots. I don't know what was going on with that. I don't know if that was Wes's idea. I don't know if it was Glenn and Bennis' idea or Matthew Barr because it just seems cheap, and it just I don't like the ending. And plus, the monster that shows up at the end looks like a fucking finger puppet. It looks terrible. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, the film does have its problems. But, um... I did think it was well edited by Robert Bracken. I thought the cinematography by Robert Jessup was... Absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. This film is actually... In a lot of ways, it kind of looked like Wes Craven's approach to John Carpenter. Like, especially with the shots of the POV of the killer walking around and and sno snooping around the house. It, it definitely did remind me a lot of uh, shots from John Carpenter's Halloween, for instance. And it features a score by James Horner, who is also sadly no longer with us, so may James rest in peace. And this score, I really like this score for the most part. There's a few bits of the score which is trying to be like the Omen with the choir and everything, that it works all right to create a creepy mood and atmosphere. But I like the other bits of the score more, that I think really work a lot more, or a lot more effective than the uh, creepy choir, because that just sounds like it's trying to rip off the omen. But anyway, the film basically centers around Martha, played by Marion Jensen, who I thought she had a little bit of a sort of slow start to her performance. Where it was just, it was alright in the beginning, but as the film got on, I, she really started to grow on me, and I really liked her performance in the end. So, Marfa, played by Marin Jensen, and Jim Schmidt, played by Douglas Barr, they live on an isolated farm called Our Blessing, where the title Deadly Blessing comes from, where most of its population are Hittites, and a, 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 a really a religious community who, according to one of their characters, make the Amish look like swingers. And Jim was a Hittite, but he left the community when he got married. Mainly because he got kicked out of the community by his father. Jim tells a neighbor, Louisa, Louisa Stoller, played by Lois Nettleton, who was a mother of faith, Lisa Hartman, that his wife, Marfa, is pregnant, and that Louisa's services as midwife will soon be needed by them. Louisa and Faith are not a part of the Hittite community either. In fact, they do not seem to like them due to the part of their... Due, to, due in part to the constant harassment of Faith by William, who chases her and calls her an all outsides incubus. So yeah, he chases her, calls her incubus, because it seems like with these Hittites, anyone that's uh, sexually uh, de supposedly deemed sexually deviant in their minds is an incubus. Which I'm like, isn't it? I thought an incubus was was a male demon and the succubus was a female demon so maybe they're, they're just getting that mixed up maybe incubus could be a, something for any demon but i just remember it being specifically associated with male demons especially even in the film called the incubus which came out a year after this film in 1982 where it that was a movie that that dealt with a male demon so i i thought incubus was associated with males instead of females so I thought this should be like calling her succubus, not incubus. But you know, it's just it's just a little little uh, nitpick, really. So that night, Jim searches in the barn after hearing strange noises from the inside, but he's murdered when a mysterious figure runs him over with a tractor, and he saw painted on the wall before that happened. Of course, even before that, like a few nights before, he saw painted on the wall incubus. Now. 
the film is a slow build. It is a, it is a slow burn. And that's one aspect of the film that I, I definitely am not the biggest fan of, is that it takes a little bit, it takes a little, more than a little while to start to get going. I mean, even after the guy gets killed by the tractor, it just plays out more like a murder mystery than really a horror film. And then you have friends Lane, Lana Marcus, played by Sharon Stone, and Vicki Anderson, played by Susan Buckner, who I really loved her. I loved her performance. She was at a very great, bubbly personality. I really love that character. I think she's very underrated, her performance in this. And I thought it was a great character. And it's and it, it's kind of it conflicts me a little bit about this film. Because I really like that character. And I like her performance. But it's one of those films where, spoiler, the character doesn't survive. So kind of hurts the rewatchability factor. But I still wanted to point out Vicki Anderson, uh, the character, and Susan Buckner's performance. Because I think it was really great. She was gorgeous and she was funny she was witty she was this, she's the type of gal i would love to 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 uh spend the rest of my life with if i ever do decide to end up doing that in the future so yeah so it was really a very wonderful performance by susan buckner so they visit martha after jim's funeral and when William Gluntz, played by Michael Berryman, goes to the house that night to search for his shoe, he accidentally left earlier when sneaking around. He's in, he ends up getting a peek of, uh, I think it's Marin Jensen naked. And then he is stabbed through the back by an unseen figure. Then the following day, William's father and Jim's father, the leader of the Hittites, Isaiah Smith, played by Ernest Borgnine, who delivers another great performance in this film. He's... I always liked Ernest Borgnine as an actor, and here he really plays this really kind of creepy character who you love to hate. You're like, shut up. You're not doing God's work. You're demented. You are, you are full of shit, and you're you're looking at this backwards. And, it, they really, and that character really did sum up that the problems with organized religion and some things like this, and how Hittites and some of the Amish... Uh, communities can kind of be cult-like in some ways. Not all of them, but some of them are, where it becomes not really a religion based on God or the ideals of God. It's more like based on the ideals of the person who's controlling the flock. So it's the, the, the religion really of the Hittites in this film is solely based on Isaiah. It's Isaiah's religion. It's his law. It's his rule. It's not God's rule. It's not what God wants. God doesn't want you to beat kids. God doesn't want you to do that. God's all about love and kindness and compassion. God doesn't want you to beat kids. Doesn't want you to shun your family because, for God forbid, they stand up to you when you're trying to beat them when they're grown men. So, uh, no, really. And so that's the whole thing uh, that really the film really did a good job showing that aspect of the religion where and it, and it, it was a great cover up too for what would come later, which would come right out of left field. And you, I did not see it coming at all because I was so busy fo being focused on Isaiah Schmidt and how how shady he was. And so he. Isaiah comes to the farm looking for William after he does not return home after being sent by his father to retrieve a lost shoe. Martha tells the men she has no idea where his William is, and they start to leave. Isaiah goes back to the back door and offers to buy back the farm for Martha, but Martha refuses. After Isaiah insults her and calls her the incubus, she asks him if he would like his answer immediately, and she answers by slamming the door in his fucking face. Martha is then now accused of being the incubus. Lana then enters the barn the next day to look for something in the barn inside a toolbox for the tractor, but all the doors and the windows suddenly close, trapping her inside in a very frightening, tense sequence. And in a panic, she searches for a way out, but she encounters a figure dressed in black. So when escaping out the now barn door, William's corpse swoops down at her, hanging from a rope. Police then clean up the mess as the sheriff, played by Kevin Cooney, advises the three friends to leave town as someone may be after them. And however, Martha decides to stay where she is and buys a gun for protection. And the multiple events follow, such as a snake being put in Martha's bathroom while she's taking a bath by an unseen figure who creeps in her house, which is another very suspenseful, freaky sequence. Which, in a way, it's the precursor to the sequence in Nightmare on Elm Street, where Freddy's glove 
comes out from in between Nancy's legs while she's in the bathtub. It's definitely a precursor to that sequence because it's very similar in the way that it's shot and the way that it's edited. And I don't know about you, I'm not really necessarily scared of snakes, really. But if a snake's in the bathtub, it, it, it's just a close proximity thing. And I, I definitely would be freaked out. I'd be like, what the f is that crawling around? Ah, snake! But, you know, snakes themselves, like, I think a lot of snakes are pretty cool. But, I mean, to be honest, if you really want them to get me, you'd be pouring, like, a fucking whole bucket of spiders in there. And I, I, I don't know what the like, I don't know what I would do. Shit, I... I Ah, just thinking about that fucking, fucking creeps me out. So anyway, she puts the snake in there, and then she manages to get out of the bathtub and kill the snake with a fireplace poker. John Schmidt, on the other hand, played by Jeff East, Marfa's brother-in-law, is unwillingly engaged to mess M Melissa, played by Colleen Riley, his cousin. However, he's attracted to Vicky, and who wouldn't be? And then John is eventually sent away from home in the community when he retaliates against his father begins hitting him. And also a little bit too because while he was looking at wedding dresses with Melissa, he ended up uh, flirting a little bit with uh, with Vicky. And then he and then he left with Melissa, chased her down. She saw what was going on. She ran away. He went after her, and he tried to kiss her. He tried to tell her, I love you, you're the one that I love, and he tried to, you know, kiss her and, and make out with her, and she wasn't having it, and then she ran away, and so it was one of those, well, you're mad at him for looking at another girl, and he's giving you affection, and you're like, no, 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 ah, and it's like, what do you fucking expect him to do? He's a grown man. I mean, it's it, just just wrong anyway. I mean, dating her cousin. I mean, that, that's that's technically that's technically uh, incest, really. So, but I, I did like Jeff East's performance in this too. He's a very soft-spoken, well-natured guy, and you really did feel for him. You wanted things to work out for him, and you wanted him to get away from this cult of Hittites. And if he eventually does, because he's sent away from the community, when he retaliates against his father, begins hitting him. He grabs him, and he just grabs him because he's hitting him with this reed. He grabs him, and he's like, no! Stop it! And, and, and then the father is just like, surprised, and then of course Ernest Borgnine, Borgnine's like, Get out! You're shunned! Your family will never remember you. No one will remember you. And it's just awful, really, the kind of things that they do. I mean, and this, this some of this stuff is, this happens. This happens for real in these communities. So then, John meets Vicky outside a, a cinema, which is showing Summer of Fear, by the way. And then she lets John drive her car, giving him a sense of freedom. And then stop at the side of the road, they begin to make out, but then they're attacked by an unseen figure who stabs John multiple times and sets fire to the car, which eventually blows up with Vicky and still inside. Which that death scene was so... There was a lot of suspense in that scene too, and there's a lot of... I was invested emotionally in that sequence because I really liked that character, and it really sucked to see her die like that. That's just so tragic. It's one of those like... I was rooting for her, I'm like, yeah, just start the car, get out of there, get out, get, get, get out, go, 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 and she starts the car, but then the flames are, are, are following her behind her, and then I'm like, get out of the car, get out of the car, and then she doesn't get out of the car, and then boom, and it explodes, and she's dead, and I'm like, oh man, that sucks, like, that sucks, I, I like that character, and then Lana has a nightmare, uh, Sharon Stone, where, and she spoke about this kind of dream before, earlier, and she's, you get the appearance that she's kooky, like she's completely going off the deep end, that she's not there. So Lana has a nightmare which a pair of hands take a hold of her head, forcing her to open her mouth as a spider falls in. Which is still one of the most, I would say the scariest, creepiest scene in the film. And it's the, one of, it's the shot that you see on the poster 
is pretty much the shot that you see is, is a part of this shot. And it's really that shot's really well shot done. It's a, in a way it's a precursor. Let's say it's another precursor. It's a precursor to Wes's nightmare sequences, the type of way he would shoot them in Nightmare on Elm Street. So has a pair of hands take a hold of her head, forcing her to open her mouth as a spider falls in. And then when she wakes up, she finds blood in a milk carton. And Marfa finds a scarecrow tied in a room with a flower that was buried with Tom. So then she goes to Tom's grave and she finds him dug up. And then she finds that there's just nothing but chickens in there. That his, his body isn't there. So the Marfa also discovers there was Louisa and Faith. And of course, this is serious spoilers, of course. Yeah, it discovers there was Louisa, Louisa and Faith who committed the murders as they attacked Melissa. Which this is the moment in the script where I, I was like, whoa. <laughs> hit me for a knock me for a loop and then Martha is chased back to her home where she engages in a quick battle with Faith I thought it was actually a pretty tense uh, struggle and then during the struggle Faith's shirt is ripped open revealing her to be a man who has been in love with Martha which is <laughs> this is even more fucking messed up and then Lana and Martha have a fight to fight Louisa and Faith and then when Martha shoots Faith she's then confronted by Louisa with a shotgun Fortunately, then, fortunately, she is too. She is also then shot by Lana, but then Faith has survived her, her his her gunshot and tries to kill Martha once more. But she is killed when Melissa stabs her in the back, which is another twist to it. I'm like, whoa, Melissa shows up and fucking, I, huh? And then Isaiah turns up and tells him that the messenger of the incubus is now dead. Which, all right. Excuse me for clearing my throat right there. But yeah, so... And then then you have this stupid ending where... The day after Lana leaves and Martha goes back to L.A. When Martha enters her home, a ghost of Jim warns her about the Incubus. The film ends immediately after the real Incubus bursts through the floor and pulls Martha back into the floor. Now the effect itself of the floor opening up and then the floor closing after it drags her in... Not that bad... But the monster, like I'm saying, it looks like one of those silly looking finger puppets you might get out of a, a machine at the gas station or the bowling alley for like 25 cents. It looks really, really bad. And it's it just kind of ruined the twist ending. I like that it wasn't, there was no supernatural aspect to the film. I like that that wasn't the case. I like that it tried to make you think that was the case, but in reality, it, it wasn't. That's what made it stand out, was the fact that there was no supernatural thing. It was just all in the, the deluded mind of Isaiah. Isaiah was the one that was thinking that there was the Incubus that was doing all of this. For to have this thing at the end where this stupid looking monster pops out of the ground and grabs our lead and basically, in essence, kills her, it's just a really shitty ending, and it's really not a, really an ending that hurts the film. I still like the movie. I still like the movie for a lot of a lot of the aspects of it. I like the movie for its mood, its atmosphere, the direction, the editing. I, for the most part, I like the story, uh, and I do I do like a lot of the sequences in the film that I actually did find pretty tense and pretty uh, freaky and definitely creepy sequences. Uh, definitely the stuff straight out of anyone's nightmares. The scene with the spider. I'm going to repeat that over and over again because that sequence is it's it's very short, but it's burned in my memory now. It's just a spider just falling right into her mouth. And uh, so there are some really great sequences in this film. and But it does have its problems. A, a slow pace at the beginning takes a little bit to get going, about 20-25 minutes before anything really starts to, to really start to get going. <coughs> Excuse me. Damn allergies. So it takes about 20, 25 minutes for anything to really start to get going in the film. And then you get, it gets going, and then there's a good amount of stuff that is, I think it's pretty well paced once it starts going. But then, the, the ending. I mean, I like the twist that they had with, with, with Melissa and Louisa and Faith, because I didn't see that coming. Especially the Faith isn't, isn't really necessarily a, a girl, which is, it's just, it's like, ah. <laughs> And, and uh, I, th I thought she was a lesbian, and that's what I thought at first, but then, like, the movie just pulls the rug out completely underneath me, and I'm like, what? Uh, but then, 
But I don't like that stupid ending with the finger puppet of Doom grabbing her and then it's just... No. Please. Pop-up monster at the end is just... It just seems like the screenwriter was just like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> fuck it. I'm gonna do it anyway. So... But yeah, I think there's actually a lot of positives that this film has. Some good performances by the cast. Marin Jensen... Uh, Ernest Borgnine, Susan Buckner, Jeff East, uh, even Colleen Riley did a solid job, uh, Lisa Hartman, Lois Nettleton, uh, Michael Behrman did alright with what he had to do, he basically played a man-child, and Sharon Stone was actually not that bad, she definitely might be at the peak of her hotness in this, because this is like her, like one of the first films, so, she's definitely gorgeous and uh, to look at, that's for sure. And the film is, too. It's a beautiful-looking film. It's got a great score by James Horner. It's got direction, the most polished-looking direction that Wes had uh, put together at the uh, at this point in his career. Up until, you know, before, you know, Hells of Eyes looked good, looked better than, than Last House on the Left. Summer of Fear is a TV movie. This was the first film where it was like, okay, man, okay, it looks like you really have something here with Wes Craven as a director. Because he's really setting up some really great shots. And uh, this is the first film where you saw that, you're, you get to see that potential that Wes would show for later films in his career. But anyway, I really don't know what else to say about Deadly Blessing. Um, except it was a rate out of five stars. I'm, I'm going to give it three and a half. I'm gonna, I think it's an above average horror film. Because there are some really horrifying moments in it that are really effective. There's some good characters. There's good performances. Good score. Good mood. Good atmosphere. Uh, good direction. Good editing. But beautiful cinematography. Stories pretty engaging. For the most part, it does a good job uh, misleading you and doing a good job uh, keeping you interested in the film. But the film suffers for it with a slow start, and it really suffers immensely from the ending. And I could use a little bit more blood, a little bit more gore, because it's trying to be kind of like a slasher, but I could use actually a little bit more, because it's pretty tame in that regard. But there's still some really effective sequences. The snake in the bathtub, the spider in the mouth, the sequence in the church, the sequence in, not really in the church, the sequence in the, in the barn, where all the doors and windows close up and, and the chair stone is locked in it and the climax at the end minus the finger puppet of doom but other than that I think it's still a pretty effective uh, film I, I liked it I definitely would like to pick it up on blu-ray from Screen Factory someday down the road and add it to my Wes Craven collection and add it to my Screen Factory collection and I'm curious to see some of the features and um, yeah it, it was a surprise. It was a pleasant surprise for me. I, I didn't love the film. I didn't love every aspect of it. I, I, I was just surprisingly uh, entertained by the film. Uh, I thought it had a lot of good will for it. But the ending, that those last few shots, the slow build, the lack of some really good uh, gore is what really made it just an above average film for me. But anyway, thank you for watching my review of Deadly Blessing, and I will see you guys later. See ya.